Welcome and thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Uh, I'm Steve Morrison, director of the Global Health Policy Center here at CSIS. Um, we're delighted today to be able to issue uh, the new paper we commissioned at the end of the summer, authored by Tom Boyke, titled Beyond Engagement, the Future for U.S. Engagement, uh, uh, Beyond Ratification, the Future of U.S. Engagement on International Tobacco Control. Um, Tom has put together a, an important, provocative, cogent and very timely uh, piece of work. Um, we're very grateful that he took this on, uh, gave it such care and careful thought. Uh, we'll start uh, this event momentarily in asking Tom uh, to walk us through the paper's uh, core argument and take 15 or 20 minutes to do that. And then we're going to move uh, to a roundtable discussion uh, on some of the key issues. And then we will invite uh, you to join us uh, in that conversation. Uh, this is part of a larger effort here at CSIS uh, to become more active and more, more visible uh, on issues pertaining to tobacco control and more generally to non-communicable diseases. Um, and um, uh, we uh, uh, will have a series of high-level speakers coming through uh, uh, the course of next year, speaking from different walks and different perspectives on these issues in April. Uh, of next year, we will be convening, and we're fixing the, the, the dates here. Uh, we're going to convene for a major conference that will bring together senior uh, representation from the Obama administration, from WHO, uh, and from some of the other constituencies that have been most involved uh, and committed on uh, global tobacco control. Uh, and so please stay tuned. We're, we're, we're finalizing which days uh, in uh, which dates uh, in April work in, in that respect. Tom Boyke is a, a, a visiting fellow at the Center for Global Development here in Washington where he investigates the legal and ethical issues that arise during the discovery, development, and delivery of essential medical technologies to the developing world. He served at the U.S. Trade Representative's Office where he led negotiations uh, with the Koreans and Chinese on international property rights issues pertaining to pharmaceuticals and biomedical technologies. Um, he has been a Fulbright Scholar in South Africa with a focus on HIV AIDS treatment issues, access issues. He holds a bachelor's degree in biology and history from Columbia University and a law degree uh, from Stanford. Um, a year ago, he produced an excellent paper on international food and drug safety issues that we uh, commissioned and published here which was quite impactful, uh, and, uh, and we're honored and delighted that he's joined with us again in putting a, a second and excellent paper together. We're also delighted to have our other three distinguished guests here today who have agreed to join the roundtable discussion that will follow Tom's presentation. Uh, Tim McAfee uh, has come from Atlanta from CDC, and we're, and we're uh, very grateful that you and, and your colleague, Kristen McCall, came today for this event. Uh, Tom is an MD and MPH who joined CDC in September as director, as the new director of the office, CDC Office on Smoking and Health. Uh, he has a very distinguished and long career as a clinician, researcher, and public health evaluator. Since 2003, he has served as the chief medical officer for Free and Clear. He also helped found and serve on the board of directors of the North American Quitline Consortium. Uh, here in the United States, he's been at the front edge of effort, multiple efforts to upgrade uh, 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 programs, including the state of Washington's multi-pronged tobacco control efforts uh, and designing various uh, research and data collection uh, initiatives. He is a co-investigator and principal investigator on multiple research studies that focus on questions relating to the effectiveness and dissemination of cessation programs, both in medical systems and government-sponsored quit lines. We're joined also by uh, Rosa Sandoval uh, from the Pan American Health Organization. Uh, uh, for the past seven years at PAHO, she has served as the specialist in tobacco control, responsible for monitoring and evaluation of the WHO Framework Convention on Tobacco Control in the region of Americas, as well as providing uh, t uh, technical support to member states. She is a public administrator trained at the Maxwell School at Syracuse University and served in various other uh, duties uh, in the ministries uh, in the Peruvian government. We're joined also by my colleague here at CSIS, Charles Freeman, 
Charles holds the Freeman Chair in China Studies at CSIS. Uh, he concentrates on the political economy of China with a special focus on trade and economic relations. Served uh, <coughs> as Assistant U.S. Trade Representative for China Affairs and served prior to that as a Legislative Council for International Affairs in the U.S. Senate. He is currently also a senior advisor to the McClarty Associates and serves on the board of directors of the National Committee of U.S.-China Relations. He is a J.D. Uh, uh, from Boston University and a, and, a, and a wonderful colleague here. So with that, I would uh, again thank you all for coming and I would turn to uh, and welcome Tom Boyke to uh, present your paper. Thank you. Is this working? Great. Uh, thank you all for coming on, uh, first thank you Steve, and then uh, thank you all for coming on a late Friday afternoon on a gorgeous day to talk about uh, U.S. engagement on international tobacco control. I feel like this is a day and part of the Washington calendar where you normally would uh, announce a firing or a tax increase or something, uh, but uh, actually the latter is something I uh, will be proposing here. The former is a potential consequence of this talk, but we'll see how it goes. Um, before getting started, I want to thank Steve Morrison and CSIS for the kind invitation to do this paper and this event to speak with you today. It has been a uh, pleasure working with Steve and with uh, Suzanne, Carolyn, and uh, Julia and the rest of the CSIS team. Uh, I also want to acknowledge the people who provided input and comments on this paper, some of the key people, and those include Doug Betcher and his team at the WHO, uh, Kristen McCall and Samira Asma at the CDC, Kelly Henning at the Bloomberg Initiative, and Brooke Cashman and Larry Gostin at Georgetown. Lastly, I want to thank uh, the Center for Global Development, which is my home institution, uh, Nancy Birdsall, Bill Savadoff, and Cindy Prieto in particular for their input and generosity on this project. So uh, I agreed to do this paper because I was interested in what the consequences of the 2009 FDA domestic regulations would be for U.S. Uh, international trade policy and global health policy around tobacco. And in thinking through that issue, I uh, ran into three questions which I didn't have a satisfying or easy answer to. The first is, what is the U.S. government doing currently on international tobacco control? The second is, uh, why should the U.S. government do more? What is the case for increased U.S. engagement on international tobacco control? And if the U.S. government were to do more, what would it be? Uh, these questions became the subject of my paper and I try to answer them in this uh, presentation today. But before getting to those questions, let me give you a little bit of background on the current state of affairs of the global tobacco epidemic. Tobacco use is the leading cause of adult disease and premature death worldwide. There are 1.2 billion smokers globally, which is one third of the adult population. 700 million children, which is 40% of all children, are exposed to secondhand smoke at home. Tobacco use is on the rise in low and middle income countries driven by uh, increasing incomes, trade liberalization, and intensive marketing. Uh, tobacco use is linked to the onset of a spectac spectacular array of diseases, including cancer, respiratory, cardiovascular diseases, uh, childhood illnesses, pregnancy complications, strokes, you name it. Accordingly, uh, the WHO has estimated that more than 5 million people a year die from tobacco use. That's actually more than HIV, tuberculosis, and malaria combined. If those trends persist, 8 million people will die by 2030 from tobacco use, and 1 billion people total in the 21st century. 80% of those deaths will occur in developing countries. Uh, but it's not just the loss of life, there are dramatic social and economic consequences to tobacco use as well. Tobacco is the top, or tobacco related disease is the top health expenditure in, develop, in many developing countries. Those costs consume scarce resources and limit the ability of health systems to address infectious diseases and other threats. 
Tobacco use also consumes household budgets, robs families of the primary wage earners, and hinders economic development. The American Cancer Society estimates that tobacco use imposes $500 billion a year in costs on the world economy, which is approximately three times more than countries raised from tobacco taxes per year. There are many global health threats that we do not know how to prevent, particularly in resource settings. Tobacco use is not one of them. Tobacco control works. It is uh, evidence-based and it's cost-effective. It has succeeded in developed and developing countries like, alike, like Bhutan, South Africa, Poland, Thailand, and elsewhere. The WHO Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, which uh, entered into force in 2005, provides a blueprint for comprehensive tobacco control and a platform for policy coordination and development. It is one of the most widely subscribed treaties in the world, with 171 parties representing 87% of the world's population. The Framework Convention uh, requires its parties to implement specific domestic tobacco control strategies to reduce the supply and demand for tobacco products. The WHO, in consultation with or with the support of the Bloomberg Initiative, developed the uh, Empower Strategy, a package of evidence-based, actionable, measurable strategies for the implementation of the Framework Convention. Despite its widespread adoption, however, the uh, Framework Convention implementation particularly in low and middle income countries and tobacco control in general in those countries is lagging. A 2009 WHO report revealed that less than 10% of the world's population is covered by any WHO recommended uh, measures to reduce tobacco uh, demand. 90% of the world are without protection for tobacco industry marketing. 95% of the world's population live in countries where cigarette taxes represent less than 75% of the retail price, and only 9% of Framework Convention member countries mandate smoke-free bars or restaurants. Now, part of the reason for that uh, slow implementation has been fierce industry opposition and the limited uh, resources, governance, and capacity of the countries involved. But part of it must be attributed to the design of the Framework Convention itself. The Framework Convention itself prioritizes inputs, specific tobacco control uh, measures and policies over outcomes, reduce tobacco use prevalence. The Framework Convention does not include or did not uh, involve providing uh, resources, incentives, and technical support for low income countries, low and middle income countries to uh, implement it. Perhaps accordingly, most of these low and middle income countries have adopted the prescribed measures that encounter the least industry resistance, educational programs and uh, prohibition on sales to minors, rather than the strategies like increased excise taxes, advertising bans, and smoke-free legislation that has proven the most effective at cutting tobacco use. So this brings us back to our first question, which is with that background in place, what is the current US government engagement on tobacco control? Well, the U.S. has a long history of leadership domestically on tobacco control. It was an early mover on uh, banning cigarette advertising on television and radio, warning labels, uh, forbidding uh, smoking on commercial flights, and the science around tobacco addiction. U.S. cities and states, New York City and California in particular, have led the way with groundbreaking and effective tobacco control programs. In 2009, President Obama uh, signed the Family Smoking Prevention and Tobacco Control Act, which empowers the FDA to regulate the domestic manufacture, labor, labeling, advertising, and sale of tobacco products. Just yesterday, the FDA proposed new graphic warning labels, an example of which you see on this slide. While more remains to be done, U.S. domestic tobacco controls have cut the percentage of American adults who smoked in 1990 or 1965 from 42% 40, of adults smoked in 1965, and in 2008 that was cut down to 19%. In contrast, unfortunately, U.S. engagement on international tobacco control has been quite limited. On January 18, 2001, President Clinton issued an executive order instructing U.S. executive branch agencies to take quote, strong action to address the potential global epidemic of diseases caused by tobacco use. 
Nearly 10 years later, however, the U.S. is one of a small number of countries that have signed but not ratified the Framework Convention. In 2009, U.S. funding for global health was $8.3 billion, while the funding it dedicates to international tobacco control was a little less than $7 million. Most of that support comes through programs at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the U.S. National Institutes for Health. Uh, Tim is going to describe CDC's efforts in depth, so I will just say now that CDC works with WHO and the Canadian Public Health Association to uh, conduct and support tobacco surveillance in low and middle income countries. Surveillance and monitoring are the bedrock upon which evidence-based effective tobacco control programs are developed and implemented. And by all accounts, CDC's contributions have greatly improved the reliability of survey data and the validity of its statistical analyses. Uh, these efforts cost the CDC less than three million in 2009, which represented less than 3% of its overall tobacco control budget. NIH's Fogarty uh, International Center has a uh, program on capacity building and training for low and middle income countries. Uh, that program provided $37 million in 25 research grants between uh, fiscal year 2001 and 2012. Uh, undoubtedly, a global tobacco control also benefits from spillover effects from U.S. And, uh, funding to the WHO generally, as well as NIH research on tobacco addiction and cessation. Uh, U.S. development agencies, however, to date have implemented almost no programs on international tobacco control. The record on U.S. trade since the 2001 executive order is mixed at best. On one hand, the office of the U.S. trade representative, uh, of which I am an alumnus, uh, was able to resist strong congressional pressure, including the holds on many of its political appointees this year, to refrain from suing Canada over its um, uh, to new tobacco control laws. On the other hand, the U.S. has uh, compelled China as a condition of its 2001 WTO accession to agree to reduce tariffs on imported cigarettes and eliminate non-tariff barriers on foreign cigarette sales. Nearly all pending and active U.S. free trade agreements reduce tobacco tariffs. All U.S. bilateral investment treaties uh, extend additional protection for tobacco-related investment. The BITS, the bilateral investment treaties in particular, have facilitated the establishment of multinational tobacco companies uh, manufacturing facilities in low and middle income countries, which has allowed them to evade tobacco tariffs and also exercise increased influence over local policy. Which moves us to our second question, so what? Why should the U.S. do more? And I think in an environment of tightening budgets and many competing global health demands, it's a legitimate question. Uh, it is not enough, in my view, to say the U.S. should increase its support for international tobacco control just because it is a moral, morally compelling problem, although it is. It uh, should be acknowledged that the U.S. engagement on tobacco control has several challenges. First is that, with, that, with the significant exception of tuberculosis, uh, most tobacco-related diseases are non-communicable. In other words, the health of U.S. citizens does not depend on the health of other country citizens with respect to tobacco. Tobacco requires sustained and coordinated interventions, which are difficult to marshal. The tobacco epidemic is at its worst in emerging economies, China, Russia, India, Brazil, and Indonesia, which have the resources to counteract this rise. Finally, many still uh, perceive tobacco use as a consumer choice involving a legal product, despite study after study that shows, shows the dangers of secondhand smoke and that most smokers start uh, smoking in their youth and underestimate the risk of addiction and its consequences at that point. This analysis, however, doesn't adequately represent all of the U.S.'s interest in global tobacco control and the Framework Convention. U.S. leadership in global health is a rare area of political consensus in increasingly partisan times. U.S. investments in global health are visible, they are concrete, they save lives and improve the credibility of the U.S. worldwide. In a recent speech before the U.N., President Obama cited global health and development as not only U.S. moral objectives, but strate strategic and economic imperatives as well. 
Secretary Clinton made a similar speech recently in which she cited humanitarian interests and economic social development as being key drivers of U.S. investment in global health. Few global health threats can compare with the human and economic toll of the tobacco epidemic. Improved tobacco control is central to the realization of U.S. global health priorities on disease prevention, on tuberculosis, on maternal and child health, and health system strengthening. The Global Health Initiative outlines three uh, criteria for making its investments. The first is that it will target what has worked in the past. The second is that it will look for areas in which there are uh, existing platforms on which to build. And the third is they will look for areas uh, that have potential strong partners. Again, few areas meet this criteria as well as tobacco control. Tobacco control uh, programs are cost effective and have succeeded in developing countries alike. The framework convention is widely adopted. Uh, and uh, the WHO, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Bloomberg, and a uh, bevy of very well established NGOs all work on anti tobacco control efforts and would be useful US partners. The third area is uh, the U.S. engagement might be able to prevent critical expansions in the tobacco epidemic. Many people see Africa as the next big market for tobacco use. Women have historically smoked less than men in developing countries, but recent surveys have shown that they now smoke at the same rate as boys in 60% of countries. Uh, the WHO, the Gates Foundation, Bloomberg Initiatives, the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids, and others are all trying to stop this expansion. Increased U.S. engagement can improve their chances of success. The U.S. has interest in the Framework Convention, even if it doesn't ultimately ratify it. Uh, failure to implement the Framework Convention undermines its utility as a vehicle for global tobacco control, as well as uh, the WHO's ability to lead on global health challenges in general, which the U.S. needs it to be able to do. Last is that inaction on international tobacco control has uh, negative consequences for the U.S. In the absence of effective uh, coordination, countries have adopted uncoordinated approaches to taxation and regulation. These have created trade, uh, trade tensions and disputes, including the recent dispute against the U.S. over its ban on clove cigarettes at the WTO and increased potential for cigarette smuggling, which has been uh, tied to organized crime and terrorism. This brings us to our third and last question. What should the U.S. do more? I mean, assuming the U.S. should do more, what should it be? Now, ideally, increased U.S. engagement on international tobacco control would begin with ratification of the Framework Convention. That would certainly be the clearest demonstration of U.S. leadership and commitment on global tobacco control and to the WHO. However, it should be recognized that this is unlikely to occur in the near term. President Obama is on record uh, supporting ratification, but the administration has not submitted the Framework Convention to the U.S. Senate. Uh, this likely reflects a sour political climate, preoccupation with domestic matters, and a general wariness of treaties more than a specific lack of interest in the Framework Convention. Last time I checked, the administration had in fact only submitted four treaties to the Senate for ratification during its administration so far, and only one of those has been ratified, which is a tax treaty with France. Uh, this should not stop the U.S., however, uh, from working with the WHO, partner governments, and non-state actors to achieve the treaty's potential. Increased U.S. support for implementation of the Framework Convention in low- and middle-income countries would accomplish many of the same objectives as ratification, showing increased U.S. commitment and leadership on the issue, and actually do more to uh, uh, improve international tobacco control since the U.S. is compliant with the Framework Convention as it is. In this paper, I argue for a four-part uh, strategy of how to do that. Uh, the first is to make global health a priority. If global health and disease prevention are U.S. Uh, priorities, then international tobacco control must be as well. The Obama administration should recognize uh, international tobacco control as a key component of the Global Health Initiative and make it its signature initiative on non-communicable diseases in advance of the 2011 U.N. summit on that issue. There should be improved global health and trade policy coherence. 
Now, trade negotiations have actually a constructive role to play on tobacco, uh, reducing tobacco subsidies and increasing, increasing international coordination on tobacco regulation. Uh, the U.S. should refrain, however, from seeking or granting tobacco tariff reductions and uh, exclude tobacco-related investment from future trade and investment agreements with developing countries. These countries simply do not have the tax regime and the ta uh, tobacco control systems in place to uh, handle the change. Finally, the U.S. should work with uh, relevant foundations and NGOs to convince multilateral and bilateral development agencies to similarly prioritize tobacco control. Uh, the second recommendation is improving resources. Successful tobacco control programs require adequate and predictable resources. Despite recent commitments by the Bloomberg Initiative and the Gates Foundation, international tobacco control is severely underfunded, particularly in developing countries. 17 countries represent 99% of the government's spending on tobacco control. Nearly 4 billion people live in countries that spend less than $20 million total on tobacco control. New sources of funding are needed. The U.S. should seek a G20 commitment to institute a surtax on tobacco consumption to fund global tobacco control programs, particularly in developing countries. The surtax should be modest on a per-product basis. The WHO analysis recently showed that a five-cent per pack tax in the high-income countries would generate $4.6 billion. That would more than quadruple the current budget for global tobacco control. The tax should be temporary. Uh, Low-income countries have the ability, and it's important for their tobacco control programs to levy tobacco taxes. The purpose of uh, this fund uh, should be to jumpstart framework convention implementation and to provide the expertise needed to build domestic taxation uh, capability. Make no mistake, imposing such a surtax would not be easy and would require high-level uh, leadership. However, G20 countries generally have such excise taxes in place already, and there has been little downward pressure on them. In fact, many countries and many U.S. states are increasing them. Effective tobacco control requires will and uh, approaches that address local uh, conditions. U.S. should build incentives for an outcome-driven, bottom-up approach to tobacco control that complements the policy-driven, top-down approach of the Framework Convention. Uh, there would be a number of possibilities for such incentives, but the one I think that is most promising is the one, uh, the Center for Global Development's cash on delivery aid concept. The basic concept here is that a funder and recipient enter into a contract in which the parties agree on an outcome, in this case some measure of uh, reduced tobacco use prevalence, and fix a payment for each unit of confirmed progress. An independent third party collects data and verifies the progress on the outcome. Here the outcome should be linked to existing studies already done uh, through the CDC and the WHO. Once progress is verified, the funder pays for improved outcomes. The arrangement is transparent and public, and the recipient is free to spend the payment according to its needs. This approach builds local institutions and creates an incentive for local solutions. By providing unrestricted rewards, it aligns local leaders, not just the health ministry, with achieving tobacco control, and tobacco control is a very multi-sectoral problem. And by, uh, it would also increase, of course, demand for technical insistence on tobacco control and surveillance. The last recommendation on, that I put forward in this background paper is that tobacco control requires a mix of expertise and inputs. Uh, taxations, customs, monitoring and evaluation that historically have not resided at the WHO. The U.S. should work with G20 partners, to scale up, G20 partners to scale up and improve those capacities. The U.S. should focus in its areas, in, for its part, in its areas of comparative advantage. Surveillance, taxation, product regulation, monitoring and evaluation. The U.S. should leverage activities that are already going on at foundations and NGOs and seek to coordinate with other donors like the Global Fund and the UN Development Fund for Women. In conclusion, uh, this is now an important moment in tobacco control. The scientific evidence around tobacco use and secondhand smoke uh, causing terminal and disabling diseases is undeniable. Tobacco programs have succeeded in developed and developing countries alike. Framework Convention is widely subscribed. 
the Empower strategy works, and the 500 million multi-year commitment from Bloomberg and uh, Bloomberg Initiative and the Gates Foundation have injected sorely needed resources into uh, tobacco control. Uh, with the cost-effective strategies I outline in this background paper, I think U.S. engagement can transform this momentum into sustainable progress against an otherwise expanding tobacco epidemic. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, I think you've laid out very well the ambiguous point that we're at where there's been much progress with the FCTC, with the Bloomberg and, and, and Gates and WHO initiative, and with this gathering sense that this is a winnable battle, that it's a best buy, that the economic price tag for GDP is, is mounting, and that the data, the demographic and epidemiological transition point that's underway right now uh, is, is also very powerful, uh, a very powerful form of sort of data and economic cost projections that are moving people to think about, okay, what next? Where do we go next right. in our approaches? And so thank you very much. You've put a couple of ideas out there that are complex and debatable. Uh, the tax issue and, and is that feasible? Who leads? How do you form the coalition? The cash on delivery proposal, those two sort of two core elements. And I think we can come back and talk a little bit more about, about those and about how one might move those and how feasible and what kind of political strategy would, would bring that. But let's, let's set that for the moment aside because I'd like to hear from our other three guests in opening and filling out the picture a bit. And I'd like to begin with Tim, Rosa, Charles. And, and Tim, I'd like you to talk for a few minutes about CDC's perspective and how and why it sees this as winnable. We heard this from Dr. Frieden when he was here uh, and delivering a major speech on the full spectrum of prevention uh, interventions that he sees as so critical on global health. He made this case. It would be good to hear a little bit more. It would be good to hear about the special capacities and assets that CDC brings to the table because you have been so central uh, for such a long time as an institution and looking forward how you see CDC supporting an engagement that would move things forward, that would reinforce the GHI, that would work collaboratively with some of the other key institutions, including the World Bank. Those are several big questions, but if you could open up and speak for a few minutes on how you see that, and we'd like to move to Rosa and ask her to talk a bit about the PAHO perspective. Tim? Great. Thanks very much. And uh, can you hear me out there? Excellent. Uh, and first, before I uh, dive into that, uh, that list, I just want to congratulate Tom on an incredible, really, I think, uh, intellectual achievement, having done such a uh, good job, of, uh, and, but succinct, but very powerfully describing what the, the, uh, the, the dire circumstances, really, that we face in the 21st century. Thank you. If we don't, if we don't do more, and, and for, uh, and I think in many ways that's the most important thing that we have to do, is that we have to convince ourselves and other leaders in global health, but not just global health, uh, the other sectors that are, that are thinking about these, these issues, both globally and in the, in the countries, that this is something that we cannot afford to be essentially, in, in the U.S., spending one thousandth of, what, of our global uh, budget on. I, I'm, uh, one of the things that attracted me to come to CDC uh, and, and head the Office on Smoking Health was uh, our historic commitment and the commitment of uh, Dr. Frieden to doing more in, in the global arena. But listening uh, to Tom describe this, I'm also essentially, I'm both proud and embarrassed that what we are doing is such a substantial fraction of all the effort that's happening in the U.S. Um, because so much more should be done. So um, at, at, at CDC, we, we've got a lot to think about you know, because we're responsible for uh, the, the health both around the, the classic things like infectious diseases, um, but increasingly also non-infectious diseases, everything from uh, traffic accidents to maternal and child health, et cetera. So one of the things that we've done over the last couple of years is to try to focus, to really step back and say, what are the things that would really make a difference in the United States? and 
in order to get on that list, which now has about five, thing, five or six things on it, uh, the characteristics are that it has to be something that's important, that's having a significant impact on the, the health of the U.S. population. But it also has to be essentially actionable. It ha there has to be something that where we have some tools where we can actually do something about. Um, and that it, there have to be uh, evidence-based activities that we know work that are not fully, fully implemented. And then finally, there, we have to have some way to measure whether we're being successful or not. And when you look at those things, uh, tobacco basically percolates right up to the top. Uh, and, and again, I'm not going to go through the same arguments that Tom did, did internationally, uh, uh, domestically. Suffice it to say that despite the fact that we have gone from 42% prevalence down to 20%, it's still the number one preventable cause of death in our country. And we have flatlined over the last four or five years in terms of dropping prevalence both in adults and in youth. So we aren't done here either. Um, so what's CDC doing about this uh, globally? Um, our, our, our primary um, activity uh, currently, if, if, you think, if you look at the Empower model that was briefly laid out where you have monitoring uh, tobacco prevalence and tobacco control activity, that's, our, that's what we've focused on globally because we built up a lot of capacity over the past decades in the U.S. about that and then over the past 10 years have been working uh, to, to systematically both apply that in some countries around the world and also to begin disseminating essentially the technology for how one goes about uh, doing this kind of ongoing surveillance. So we've had, uh, we've worked with uh, WHO and countries to create a global tobacco surveillance system, have assist assisted over 160 countries um, conducting youth surveys um, and, and this is an incredible operation where, where we, we've mostly looked by going into to, to, um, schools themselves, uh, training, training local staff on how to administer these surveys, and then, and then also more recently have also been doing this with uh, school personnel and healthcare, uh, students in, in healthcare. And, and, um, and then we've also been working more selectively around adult surveillance, particularly with help from the Bloomberg Foundation, uh, where over the past few years we've been looking at 14 of the, the key countries in the world that are that for, for which tobacco is the the, lar the largest problem and the cover of the largest segment of the world. And I'll just briefly tell you a few things that we found. Uh, this is we are, we're just completing. The, the 14 countries, and, and we'll probably see things in 2011 about the aggregate uh, information from these countries. But just earlier this week, uh, the Russian Federation uh, released the results of their global adult tobacco survey. A and this is uh, helping to kindle a very strong response on the part of, uh, of the Russian government uh, around the, the release of these figures, which found basically that uh, Russia is at the head of the pack that they wish they weren't, that they have the highest adult prevalence of smoking of any country in, in this uh, group of, of 14. Um, and, and that, but to give you a couple flavors from the adults, uh, China, w which is fairly close to Russia in, in male smoking, it also has a, the, the largest gap around knowledge. That, that is the country where there's the least perception in the population that smoking is bad for the smoker or that exposure to environmental tobacco smoke is bad. But you also pick up interesting things like even in Russia, over 80 per, over 80 percent of the population believes that um, advertising should be banned, that, they should, that the tobacco industry should not be able to advertise. Even more than almost three quarters of smokers think advertising should be banned. So this type of information is helping all these different countries with, with drill down information. We're starting to get into second cycles and third cycles and fourth cycles, particularly with the youth, the youth surveys that's um, helping out. One of the most disturbing things that the youth survey has found for the 21st century is that um, unfortunately um, in 70 countries where we have both youth and adult uh, survey information, 58 of them showed that cigarette smoking for girls 
is as high or, uh, or higher than the current rate of women. So rather than driving this down, we're looking at the potential for an increase uh, in, in smoking in, in women as girls age, age into the, the population. Um, in terms of what we can do, I'm trying to recall everything that you'd ask, but, but in terms of what we think we can do, um, well, there's the other five letters in the EMPOWER model. And CDC has had a lot of experience uh, over the past 20 years working with the 50 states, the territories, and the uh, tribal entities in really helping them to figure out um, what more they can do with their uh, regional resources to try to take a comprehensive effect to decreasing the effects of tobacco use in their, in their populations. So essentially, we've been resource constrained at our capacity, even though we're, we're, we're getting more and more requests uh, from, from specific countries uh, to try to do more for countries around um, taxa you know, taxation policies. How, how do you work through all the arguments that are for, for tax, uh, taxation policies? Uh, for uh, secondhand smoke, what are, the, what, are, what are the tools that you can use to convince your governmental I entities, your, your private entities, your NGOs, that you won't cause economic hardship by, by uh, eliminating s uh, secondhand smoke exposure in, in public places. All these sorts of things are very, very strategic, and, and some of this is going on, but, but it's kind of catch as catch can, and that's where um, your core recommendation that there needs to be some way that we figure out um, to, to make available more technical assistance and more support um, is going to be really, cr really critical. And I think the, the, the will is there, and, and we need to figure out um, some ways to do this. Just a couple practical examples of this. Um, I mean, one of the problems that we, we struggle with in, uh, around tobacco is that because it's more of a non-communicable disease than communicable, um, and we're not even, and it's less of a non-communicable, I mean, people just don't frame it up as a disease. It, it's buried, it's hidden in statistics. And people don't think about it when somebody dies of heart disease or even lung disease. But we, we, we have some clear, easy wins where, for instance, tuberculosis, which is significantly impacted by smoking status, both, both um, the becoming infected with tuberculosis, but then the, the, the course of the disease is, is affected dramatically by smoking. And so it's essentially completely illogical. If you're doing a routine, repetitive kind of monitoring, you're giving people drugs, you're setting up this big infrastructure in, in Africa to do all this stuff, and if you're just functionally ignoring the fact that somebody is smoking, it makes no sense at all. So I think we're starting to do some work, and there's a lot of good stuff that's beginning to happen in, in that particular arena. Uh, to, to help with that. Maternal and child health is another great uh, example where, where there's, there's um, smoking during pregnancy is a, a major contributor to uh, particularly preterm labor and other negative outcomes. And this is something, again, where we're working hard to have routine prenatal care. It just doesn't make sense to, try to not embed addressing smoking in that kind of element. Um, I, I did just want to, you know, okay for just a couple more points? Sure. How are we doing? Um, I, I wanted to, the, the one other point I would make, um, I think, around Tom's thesis around the 5% surtax is that we have not done a good job in the developed countries of figuring out how to use revenue that's come in from tobacco taxes to fund tobacco control. And in the U.S., we've actually gone backwards in the last two years. The states have, have lost about a, almost a third of their funding in the last two years for tobacco control, disproportionately diminished funds for state tobacco control relative to their larger state budgets. So it's, it's related to the recession, but it ain't just the recession. And this is, in, in many states, this happened concurrently. 20 states increased their tobacco taxes in the last uh, two years. One state, South Carolina, the state that had the lowest tobacco tax in the country, is the only state that provided even a penny towards anything related to tobacco control. So we're in a very kind of strange position around this. And so I think that, that is a, that, that's a, a 
an approach to tobacco taxation that, that perhaps we should think twice about, about exporting uh, to the developing, uh, developing world. It, it, if this is a, a, a almost unique area where actually if, if, they, if they institute the, the prime policy at the, at the policy level that we're proposing, which is to increase taxation, they simultaneously have at their fingertips the capacity to fund tobacco control in a manner that's almost unprecedented because it only takes a tiny fraction of, a, as you've illustrated with the five billion from a five cent tax. This, this applies in Thailand is a great example of this uh, where they, they instituted an 83% excise tax on cigarettes, only took 2% uh, of, of a tax, tax surcharge that they collected for health promotion and then used a fraction of that 2% to apply towards, uh, towards uh, tobacco control. And they've been much more successful because they essentially took the, bill, the bull by the hands and, and actually used tobacco tax revenue to try to improve health. So with that, I think I will <coughs> wind down and let, let uh, Rosa go on. Thank you very Apaho. much. Um, Rosa, could you describe for us the perspective of the Americas in terms of where you see uh, progress, where you see the unfinished business. What's the attitude with respect to prioritizing tobacco control among member states? Because so much of this comes down to perceived sovereign best interest. And you're in the position the, the, uh, of, of, of seeing the big picture of the Americas and the way this issue has played through over the last seven years. So if you could paint the picture for us a bit. <coughs> Congratulations, Tom, for your article. I really enjoyed reading it. The FCTC has been my life for the last seven years, so it was very nice to read your article and especially to see concerns that uh, we working on tobacco control in low middle income countries have, especially the need for more technical assistance from those countries with more expertise in general in tobacco control or in specific issues. Coming to back to your question, well, in the Americas, the, the panorama is like you describe it. Many countries have ratified the FCTC. We have 35 countries in the Americas, and 27 have ratified it. That means eight have not, the US among them, unfortunately, and but widely ratified in, in a region, which means then that many countries have mandates to implement. As you may know, the FCTC has deadlines for certain articles to be implemented. So um, the first article whose deadline um, expired, I don't know if that's the verb I should use for that, but you get the meaning, um, was Article 11 on packaging and labeling, health warnings, the news that we just had on the US in the recent days. And that article is supposed to be implemented three years after a country ratifies the FCTC. Most of the countries in the Americas ratified between 2003 and 2006, which means that we have 22 countries that, had that should have implemented that article at this point, and we have 13 who have done so. So this is, uh, the thing is that since Brazil, the US, Canada, and Mexico are among those 13 countries that have um, implemented this article, we have 86% of the population in the Americas that are covered by that mandate. But then, as I think you mentioned in your article, well, Article 11 on packaging and labeling, you know, putting information for consumers to know that this is a harmful product shouldn't be that difficult for a government to implement. So on, on one hand, we are very happy, are proud to report that this has been the, the main progress. On the other hand, we are like, well, this is something um, you know, let's say basic, that we as health uh, public officials should implement in, in our respective countries. So let's move on to more difficult policies and, and also, as you mentioned, more effective, smoke-free environments and taxation. And there, uh, and also banning advertise, advertisement and promotion and sponsorship. In a smoke-free environments, that's the second type of intervention where we've had more success or more countries implementing this. Um, for this policy to be implemented, a country has to enact a law banning smoke, uh, smoking 
in all public places, indoor public places and workplaces. Basically what we have in the District of Columbia, for example, or in many states in the US. Nine countries in our region have done so. We don't count the US because the US doesn't have a federal law, although have many states that have done so. We count Canada because all of provinces in Canada have done so. So since by subnational laws they are a smoke, a banning smoking, then we include Canada in this list. But we also have Guatemala, Panama, Colombia, Peru, Barbados, Honduras, and Trinidad and Tobago. And I want to stop on Uruguay because Uruguay has been the, I'm going to say, our little baby in terms of, of implementing the famous Empower policies before the Empower acronym came to existence. And uh, Uruguay started doing this in 2006, 2005 actually, with the decrease. And this was because of having, well, not only because of that, but one thing that contributed to this was the fact that the president was an oncologist, the former president of Uruguay, and very interested in, in general in, in non-communicable diseases and in particular on tobacco control. So there was political will there. So. And, and that's how this happened in Uruguay. And my point being that there's political bill in small countries that are willing to move forward to implement their, their, their mandates that they committed to when they ratified the FCTC. But there is not necessarily enough technical assistance or financial resources to do that. And um, the same thing in banning advertisement, which is very difficult because this is something that the tobacco industry opposes, I would say, in a greater way than in other policies. Uh, this year, when Peru um, approved a law on uh, health warnings and, and banning smoking in public places, uh, the tobacco industry, well, unofficially, or BAT in particular, unofficially said that um, you know, smoke-free environments are health warnings. Well, they would not uh, greatly oppose, but adver banning advertisement, promotion, and sponsorship would be something that mm. they would fight. So surprisingly, we don't have a ban on advertisement, promotion, and sponsorship in, in many countries right now. Only two countries have been able in the Americas to do so, Panama and Colombia. And of course, they face a challenge to implement it. In taxation, you know, covering the, the, the main policies, not talking surveillance, but uh, in taxation, we have the recent success in Mexico that in September approved an increase in tobacco taxes of seven pesos. That's uh, about 60 cents US dollars, which is going to be very important. Uh, the effect is going to be uh, great and in consumers because the uh, pack of cigarettes, an average, the average pr price of, of a pack of cigarettes, cigarette is going to move from about two dollars to almost three dollars. So it's it's going to have an impact, and and hopefully we're going to be able to measure this in the in the coming months. So to summarize this, um, yes, some there is there is political will in some countries. Mm -hmm. Some countries have made progress, but the progress has been unequal, and uh, and let's say slow in, in general. Uh, many of the countries that ha I have mentioned, with the exception of Uruguay and Panama, have enacted laws in the last two to three years. Uh, so yes, I think there's a momentum for tobacco control in our region as well. And, and the dynamic is very fast. Uh, you know, once the president or the president of the, of the health commission at, at the Congress wants to move forward the legislation, the request for technical assistance is, is immediate. It's like we need experts to come and present to Congress members the evidence that banning smoking in public places is not going to harm bars and restaurants. And you need to go like the next week you know, and, and do that, that presentation. Uh, we need to, um, to present to the Ministry of Finance the ev worldwide evidence that increasing tobacco taxes is going to increase revenues and how to improve their, their uh, tobacco taxation structure as to reduce consump consumption, but at the same time increase, increase revenues. And those are the challenges that we face on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and 
definitely having the umbrella of the Bloomberg Initiative has helped us uh, work in a better way. Uh, PAHO, uh, we are the Secretariat of the Ministries of Health in the Americas, so we, response to what we respond to what national authorities request us. But it's been great to work together with uh, American organizations like the Campaign for Tobacco Free Kids, who have the expertise on tobacco taxation and on mass communication media, as to convey the message to, to policy makers. So that's the situation. If you want me to elaborate, I can <laughs> speak, you know, two <laughs> days about tobacco <laughs> control and the FCTC, but I'll stop there. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you Rosa. That's, 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 uh, that's, a very, that's a very nuanced, crisp summary and, and, uh, and a positive one, really, in some respects, in what you're describing in terms of the, the momentum and progress that you've seen in some key places um, mm -hmm. in, in recent years. But also I hear you saying that there really is an appetite for doing more. Mm -hmm. There are some clear unmet demands in which mm -hmm. external, some sort of external support in technical and financial mm -hmm. sources might actually deliver some quick returns. Um, uh, so thank you. Charles, tell us a bit more about the, the China context in terms of the, I mean, you, uh, oftentimes there's considerable pessimism around getting movement on tobacco control, and getting the government to see it as in its best financial or stability or mm -hmm. political governing best interest to take this issue on. Um, there's many big uh, and harrowing projections made around the consequences of smoking in China. So tell us a bit more about how this plays itself through right well, now. First of all, I mean, CSAS is a, is a pathologically nonpartisan organization, so I thought I was here to represent smokers, but um, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I guess I guess not. I mean, we'll go well, there. It depends. No, but the, <laughs> but I, I guess you know. First of all, let me let me congratulate Tom on an excellent excellent paper, and and uh, I expect nothing less of a fellow UST, USTR alumnus. But um, particularly focusing on the the, the hypocrisy uh, that in in trade agreements with respect to continuing to negotiate on behalf of tobacco uh, uh, tariff reductions, and and uh, uh, even at the same time as we we are very cognizant of the challenges here and are trying to, to move, um, uh, I think is, is absolutely important and something that, you know, I don't think there's a whole lot of people in the healthcare community, with WHO or elsewise, that focus on the trade impacts or trade aspects of, of this issue. And, and I, I think knitting the two, the two sides together is, is very important. I, I, um, you know, I'm used to talking as a China person. I, this is not an area of particular expertise for me, but uh, I'm used to talking as a China person of, of superlatives or big numbers. And, and the, the numbers with respect to smoking in China are, are, um, are superlative is probably the wrong word, but um, you know, you've got, China is the largest producer and consumer of tobacco products. Uh, about 300, between 300 and 320 million Chinese smoke. That's one in three people, world, well, smokers worldwide. And of those people, um, the most recent uh, survey that was done, I think by WHO arm, suggested that only 16% of Chinese smokers are actually considering quitting. Um, there are about one million tobacco yet deaths a year. That's again, that's about one in four tobacco-related deaths uh, globally uh, are Chinese. That will double in the next 10 years. Um, and I think, as Tom pointed out, there's a, a shocking percentage of between a third and 40% and of, of Chinese medical personnel who actually are smokers. So you know, when you've got six in 10 doctors and professionals that are smokers, You've got, a, you've got a major social challenge um, even before you, you get to the question of how do you deal with, with people that don't know better. Um, since 1980, in 30 years, lung cancer up 465%, although as some will say, perhaps that relates to a, a failure to diagnose back in 1980, um, the lung cancer, um, but, but even so, a shocking number. Um, and, and then you get to, I think, one of the, the heart of the, the, the root of the problem. Uh, the China National Tobacco Monopoly um, does $76 billion a year in profit and taxes, $61 billion of which is taxes. Um, this, that, none of that, I can assure you, goes to uh, tobacco prevention. Uh, that is a major source of revenue for a government that, uh, that is constantly on the prowl for new tax revenue. So the fact that tobacco is such an important revenue source is an enormous challenge. And meanwhile, if you've got that $61 billion figure in mind, the Ministry of Health 
uh, calculates that only about 22.7, $23 billion are uh, costs, medical costs related to, to uh, tobacco consumption. So in China, there is a perception that unlike, I think, some of the things that Tom was bringing out, there's a perception that, well, the, the numbers are worth it. You know, for the $61 billion you get in taxes, you only have to, to give up $23 billion in, in, in costs. So uh, again, you, you, you have this, uh, this inherent, I mean, Tom was talking about the importance of putting incentives in place to, to uh, prevent tobacco use. Um, really, the, the disincentives in, in China are rife, both on a social level, a, um, a, a revenue level, and, and uh, um, you know, even on a health level uh, from what they're seeing. I think um, one of the most damning things that can be said about uh, about China's approach to this is China did ratify uh, the, the Kramer Convention in 2006 and immediately turned over uh, management of implementation of the, F of the FCTC to the same ministry that is responsible for overseeing the tobacco monopoly. So you effectively have the, the, the fox uh, guarding the hen house with respect to tobacco control and uh, uh, you know, and, and with very little incentive to dramatically increase implementation. Now, what's interesting recently, and so if to, for those of us that are looking for signs of, of, uh, of, of, of optimism here, you know, the, the Ministry of Health has been very vocal in its criticism, not just of the structure of FCTC uh, implementation, but of the need for increased attention to tobacco control generally. So even though there is this kind of back of the envelope calculation about health costs, I think there's a recognition somewhere at some point that the health costs associated with tobacco um, uh, prevention and, and tobacco use are, are much higher than perhaps, perhaps they, uh, they, they, they talk about. If, uh, if I sort of look at that sort of the three issues that um, are challenges and need to be overcome in China, and then I'll, I'll shut up. Um, you know, first of all, it's the it's the the housing of implementation. I mean, clearly, the, the Ministry of Health, if anybody, should be the more responsible for implementation of FCTC than the Ministry of Industry and Information Technology, which doesn't make a lot of sense. I would argue probably because the Ministry of Health is frankly a fairly weak organization within the Chinese bureaucracy that uh, there should be an effort to put this kind of implementation directly under the State Council uh, or as perhaps under the, the Politburo, you've got um, uh, the premier, the incoming premier in 2012, the likely premier, who has taken a, a strong interest and role in Chinese health care reform. Uh, it, it, that would be an appropriate person to be championed for this to the extent that he would be, um, he would look at this as a, a, uh, a source of, of political utility. Um, but I think that's the clearly the bureaucratic effort to to, to take on this, this challenge has not been very serious to date. Um, with respect to the, the question about 23 billion versus 61 billion, um, I think you know, you're, when you get down to it, the numbers have to be debated. And particularly when you consider that the vast majority of Chinese don't have any health care at all. They are not covered by insurance. They don't seek treatment. And therefore, their deaths are not counted as, as, uh, in the, as part of the, 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 the expenditures. They don't get they, because they're not getting any payments out of the state, or they're not cost. They're not costing anything. They are dying, and they're effectively a zero cost um, loss from smoking. The as the Chinese do roll, as China does roll out more effective healthcare reform and implementation, I think you will see that those numbers escalate quite dramatically. And particularly when you're getting to a question by 2020, when a lot of healthcare healthcare reform is supposed to have taken place, when you're getting it to two million deaths from tobacco use a year, that number is going to be significantly higher than $61 billion. And so that's the point at which the Chinese government starts to think and says, well, maybe we ought to take a more uh, pragmatic approach to this. Finally, um, and, I, and I'm not sure what the right answer to this is, um, Beijing and the Chinese government is um, obsessed with social stability, obsessed with that as a matter of domestic political survival. Um, to the extent that there is an effort by Beijing to employ bread and circuses to, uh, to, uh, uh, to maintain social stability. stability. For, for the 800 million, 750, 800 million rural residents, smoking is the circus. 
um, the average Chinese, uh, uh, average farmer or peasant out in the rural community um, really uh, counts on his or her uh, cigarette um, or pack or three packs in, in many cases. Um, and denying that is going to be, I think, perceived at least by Beijing as a major source of political instability. The question is, can we and other middle income uh, countries, you know, can we and can middle income countries around the world take the example, pro appropriate examples of, of tobacco prevention and control and demonstrate that it doesn't necessarily result in massive instability. Um, I, I think that's something that, that where above and beyond the question of technical expertise, I think that's something that, that Beijing really does need to see over the next, uh, next few years. Um, I will say though, having just come uh, from uh, Beijing and gone out to eat with some friends at a, at a restaurant, um, I, I mentioned the fact that um, uh, it was quite remarkable that everybody in, in the entire restaurant was smoking and that you know, we had smoking bans in the United States. Uh, the notion that uh, among my, my fellow um, patrons that we would actually uh, institute a smoking ban in, in China was uh, perceived as the most ridiculous thing possible. So got a long way to go. So thanks. Thanks, Charles. Um, let's come back to Tom uh, for a moment and let's revisit this whole question of political feasibility. I mean, we've heard a lot about what is possible. Um, you've proposed a tax, a surtax, uh, G20 surtax. Um, there's the whole question of where is the political will and the consortium that could drive such a process? Because it will take leaders. It will take some combination of leaders that choose to conclude that it's in their best interest to move such a thing forward. And, and we haven't really heard much here so far, about the power of industry. I mean, there is a, a whole counter argument that the industry, as it faced the framework convention coming into force, uh, as, it, as, it, as it saw the Bloomberg and Gates and WHO initiatives come forward, as it saw certain other countries beginning to put stronger regulatory uh, 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 environments in place, the industry has not been passive. Uh, and it's, it's been documented uh, quite, quite dramatically by analysts like Jonathan Samet and others about you know, the, the muscularity and the, and the robustness of that. So when you look at the political feasibility, you have to take into account the possibility of a strong counter reaction uh, that would perhaps nullify or stop in the tracks those who are making a political calculation of how much of a priority should this be? Okay, yes, we know the data is there. We know the economic costs are there over the long term. We know we have an opportunity this year with the NCD summit in September of 2011, um, and you know all of the other things. We know we have a treaty. We know we have a framework. We know it works. All of those things are strong arguments, but you have to be, you have to address this political feasibility and the fact that there's not a passive opponent. There's a very active and muscular opponent. Just tell us a bit about that. How do we move your strategy forward against those questions? Sure. Uh, well, thank you uh, for that great question. I also want to thank the rest of the panel for their very um, generous uh, comments about the paper. It's uh, nice to meet Tim and Rosa in person and share a stage with you. It's always nice to see Charles. I'm actually reminded that uh, Charles was the person who introduced me to Steve, so in a way is uh, to blame for all of this. Uh, so political will. Uh, tobacco, well, I, I think you certainly need it on taxation for any, any uh, social goal. As uh, I've suggested before, there has been an extreme willingness. It's not a question of raising tobacco taxes, in my view. I think there's been a lot of willingness in many countries, particularly high-income countries, to do that. The real challenge is the one that Tim mentioned, is getting them to use a portion of that to actually spend it on international tobacco control. And I think there, there's uh, two, two uh, uh, ways to do that. The first, obviously, is, is leadership. When you think about other contexts in which taxation has been employed as a funding device for global health aims, you think of uh, President Chirac around unit aid and the personal leadership it took mm -hmm. to institute a taxation, actually in that case on an entirely unrelated 
uh, unrelated service uh, to use that resources. And it only garnered, in that case, about seven, seven countries. I have been told by other US government high-level officials not at the CDC, one of the real challenges is that tobacco is not on the radar in global health discussions throughout much of the US government. And that has to change. And you know, encouraged by the opportunity to do this paper and this event because I think that these are the kinds of things in the lead up to the 2011 summit that have to uh, push that forward to try to generate that leadership. But that's what I, I think you need to see. So that's the first component is real political leadership. Second is there's actually history for, um, I think it's Australia, but I'm sure somebody here will correct me, of tying tobacco taxes to uh, things that the domestic country wants as an explicit bargain, so to speak, for imposing higher taxes. So I, I think it's Australia that was able to do this quite successfully, which is ex ante, say what they will use the rest of the taxes for domestically to build support for it, and then mm -hmm. that they will also do it for this. So I think that type of strategy may make sense in this context as well. Um, I also think on the political side that it, it does need to be recognized that you need differential strategies. Um, I think the COD8 approach, as I mentioned in the paper, I think makes a lot of sense for uh, low-income countries where you do not have this level of a tobacco epidemic yet. Mm -hmm. That it will be persuaded for the types of awards that you could provide through uh, that type of incentive mechanism. It is not a solution for China. Um, you are not going to be able to mobilize the kind of funds you would need to uh, really alter what's happening in that situation through uh, any incentive or prize mechanism. Maybe it could work on a subnational level, I don't know, but uh, it certainly is not going to function on a national level. But I do think preventing expansion of the tobacco epidemic in Africa with women, I think, is is important because if it takes hold there, you're really looking at a substantial increase even on those numbers that I put forward. Great. Thank you very much. Let's open to the floor for some comments and questions. Uh, we'll have, we have microphones. Uh, so let's take uh, uh, three, a round of three quick comments and questions. Please just put your hand up or stand up and, and identify yourself. and. Uh, and we'll, t we'll take three, and then we'll come back to our speakers. If you wish to direct your question or comment to, to a specific person here on the round table, please feel free to do that. It's late Friday afternoon, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> right here. You wowed them, Charles. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Jerome Pichella from the Canadian Embassy. Please speak up a bit. Yeah, it's on. OK. It's so Jerome Pichella from the Canadian Embassy, just a very small thing. When you mentioned Australia, possibly, in Canada, that's actually what's been done. So taxes on cigarettes on the provincial level are usually explained. Um, usually it's explained to the public what they're going to be used for. For instance, in Quebec, where I come from, everybody knows that smokers have paid for specific programs, shall we say. And it's usually something that's not so popular with the smokers, but popular with everybody <laughs> else. So that's it. And those monies are put towards dedicated yeah, tasks. Yeah. Okay. Other comments or questions? All right. Let me come back then to to our um, to our speakers and and ask them about what they think the 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 value could be of moving towards this summit next September. I mean, the. You could, you could. There's a, a uh, an alliance forming. There's three or four other key focal areas where attention could be dedicated. But in when you look at tobacco, you have this existing framework. You have a consensus. You have mobilized interests. You would think that it would be a win. That this would be a big moment to sort of move the debate forward significantly. Do you feel that that is? that that is true? And if so, how would you begin to frame out the approach to get the best outcome next September? Tim, do you have a? Well, uh, it, in some ways, this might be a small piece of it. But I, I was actually thinking, as Rosa was talking about, the, the needs in, in the Americas mm -hmm. for, for technical assistance. And I had sort of been saying, well, gee, we, we have all this technical assistance expertise that we're not really 
basically bringing to bear because uh, we we don't ha we, we we sort of had the resources, but we don't have the mandate, the the fiscal mandate to do it. So it's whether, in some ways, a a a, a kind of crisp drill down around what the technical what, what what a technical assistance program that was really global, but both probably country, regional, and global in nature would really look like. And and I think this is something where mm -hmm. you know WHO could also uh, play a good coordinating uh, role as well as the the regional organizations like PAHO, what do you need? What, what if you had, you know, X, Y, Z, you know, how would it help move forward? And, and, and then how, how could it, how could we create structures and infrastructures given both the, the existing national and international organizations that uh, house the expertise, but also house the, the delivery capability for that? How could we do it? Where could we get the money? Um, I think that would be, uh, make people really understand the gap and, mm -hmm. and that there, there, there really is a, a very, some very practical things that could be done mm -hmm. that, would, that would dramatically. So scoping out the, the gap, the unmet demand with much greater gr granularity in going yeah. towards the summit is, is, is one big win that you would imagine. Rosa, what do you think? Well, yes, uh, uh, but, but before uh, this year to, to team I was thinking on the opportunity that the summit provides provide us to convey once again, like Tom said, to put it in the radar. Because what you mentioned for the US, it's also the situation for many countries in, in our region. It's just that tobacco is, is not there in the, in the public agenda. And so once, most of the time, by chance, you have the attention of, you know, high-level Congress members in, in or uh, national authorities from sectors other than health, which are already convinced, mm -hmm. then it's like when suddenly, yes, we can increase taxes. I mean, that's not difficult. Or yes, we can you know, draft this, prepare this bill, and put it for discussion. So for us, the summit is, is this opportunity to put tobacco control as, as one risk factor and one of the main risk factors in the non-communicable diseases epidemic there on the radar. And, and in terms of, of what technical assistance we need, yes, I, I think we definitely have now, I mean, after five years of working in trying to implement the FTTC, because the first, between 2003 and 2005, was mostly you know, uh, communicating what the FTTC is and the importance of ratifying it. And around 2005, 2006, we moved towards implementing it. I think, uh, I think now the community has a pretty much you know, idea of mm -hmm. what specifically is needed after having been presenting evidence at, I don't know, five or six different congresses in, in, in the countries in America. And what about political leadership? I mean, one of the, one of the uh, uh, uncertainties around the summit next September is which heads of state or which prominent global opinion figures are going to show up to make the case? I mean, they, when you look back at the UN uh, special, special session on HIV AIDS a decade back, which is sort of seen as a groundbreaking moment and one that turned global opinion and turned opinion in key states, it's pretty powerful global personalities showing up and making the case. Who's going to take? Who's going to lead the, the the way on tobacco at this point? Do you think, or who might be enlisted to sort of play that leadership role? I mean, I think you can. I think you're right, Tim and Rosa, that scoping the unmet demand and bringing it across and making it clear as to that this is feasible and affordable, and these things can be done, and mm -hmm. and and s trying to set the bar in terms of the next five years could could achieve these things, or the next, you know, set some concrete parameters and objectives. That would be p significant progress. But there needs to be some kind of political leadership breakthrough that, 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 that we haven't seen. And, the, you know, Gro Brundtland drove that FCTC. And, 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 it, and it's been in force now for several years. Uh, and I think the un much of the uncertainty around it today is a money-based, mm -hmm. But it's a political will-based uncertainty. So we need to address address that as well in looking forward. Do you 
Charles, any thoughts? Well, it would be useful if the political leaders didn't smoke. That, that would be a good start. <laughs> um, but we won't, we, won't, we won't name names. I, I think you're absolutely right, though. I mean, it, 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 it requires more than numbers, it requ both economic numbers and health numbers. It, it, it requires it's, uh, a small number of individuals who have uh, authority and power to do something who grasp what this is and see it as an opportunity for them to make a mark on the world and then mm. to do it. Yeah. Um, and, and so maybe that's for those of us who may not actually be in that position ourselves, but that one of the things that we should set as our task between now and then is, is trying to see if we can actually make the case uh, to people both of the opportunity here, but also the personal opportunity that somebody may have to really make a difference because I mean, that is one of the things that is you can say about this, the tobacco epidemic is that it is something where there's a, there's a leadership gap. And, and so it, it, it does provide an opportunity. It, it's tremendously challenging to do something, partly because of that, but it also is a tremendous opportunity for uh, an individual or small number of individuals to make a real difference. Yes. Tom? Um, well, I think that Charles's point earlier about uh, uh, the view of um, hypocrisy around U.S. trade policy with what we're doing domestically on tobacco control actually plays out also in the global health context um, of what we're doing domestically being so different from what we're doing internationally and what the potential is there. So I think that it's incumbent on the people that work full time in these areas to to, to make that case in a way that is clear. Um, because I think for, it's, it's not just the US, there are other developed countries as well, but the country, a number of countries have uh, expressed a strong interest in uh, pursuing global health for reasons talked about in the um, presentation there. And I think it's really making it clear about uh, the potential in this case for relatively low amounts of investment making, an enormous yeah. amount of difference um, is, is uh, significant. So I think it's in part making that case yeah. in advance. I mean, part of it might also be that you have, um, you have a framework emerging for this summit. You have leadership coming out of CARICOM and Sir George Alwain and, and Jamaica and Luxembourg charged. And the Secretary General at some, at some point is ultimately carrying some responsibility and there's still time. There's still time to, to think through how do you put the burden of delivering leaders from low and middle income countries in particular as well as from the wealthy countries. If this is seen as something that is carried overwhelmingly by wealthy countries, by, by the United States and Canada, it's, it's, it's not going to go very far. I just don't think it's going to go very far. If it's seen as lecturing the emerging powers dominating the G20, it's not going to go very far. Uh, so there's got to be uh, a game plan. And I think it's a game plan that has to be one that extends well beyond next September. It's got to be a game plan that sees that as an important sort of step. Charles, I know we're getting I've at day, five. I've got daycare issues. And we have some daycare <laughs> issues. So do you have any, if maybe we should, we should take one last round of comments and then we can close. So, Charles, would you like to offer, talk a, just a, a quick bit on illicit trafficking? Uh, well, in, I mean, in, I, mean it's, in, uh, in I, think, I think one of the things that, that back during my USTR days that when we were looking at, at things to, uh, to, uh, to, to focus on with respect to intellectual property rights, um, challenges that are coming out of China, and we looked at, at you know, what pirated and counterfeit goods are coming from China into the United States. You know, the overwhelming number of, of uh, uh, dollar value uh, 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 of goods coming from China that was pirated were essentially cigarettes. Uh, tobacco products coming from China represented well over 50% of the, of the total seizures of, of trafficked goods in, in intellectual property. That doesn't mean necessarily that these were fake, that there was sawdust in these cigarettes. That just means that, that these were perhaps um, you know, US branded product that was produced overseas coming into the, into the States. So, it's a, it, so there is a huge challenge there. Um, 
And those products that come in, remember, are not subject to the same kind of tax uh, regime that, it, that is in place. And so none of that uh, goes to, to prevention and control. So it's a, it's a major challenge, and, and you know, Customs does their best. But uh, to be candid, um, these are not seen as the highest order of priority from Customs to seize, seize um, uh, these kind of, kind of illicit traffic in, in tobacco goods. Rosa, does this issue figure in PAHO's strategy? You, you should say? Yes. Yes, yes. Well, I, I, just, I don't know if you know that there is a protocol on illicit trade being negotiated under the EFTC. And, well, definitely, I'm coming back to your question about, about the leaders. Um, well, one of, I mean, the group of Mercosur, the countries <coughs> in the southern cone, have been very proactive in terms of, of um, discussing the illicit uh, trade impact on public health and also on, on economic issues. So uh, it is it is a public health problem for, for us. It is, um, though, I mean, I have to say, located in certain areas in a region. In the southern cone, there's mostly counterfeit uh, mm -hmm. cigarettes coming from one country to the other three. And then a bit in the Caribbean, uh, and in Central America, no, no, not much. I mean, the Indian area, I mean, Peru, Colombia, and Ecuador, there is some, but nothing, nothing apparently, or so far we haven't identified a big source like, uh, like in Paraguay. So yes, this is, this is an issue, and, and, and I hope that uh, looking towards the, the UN summit in, in September, that middle-income countries in our region that have been leaders in tobacco control might, I hope they take also this as an opportunity to to be leaders in this uh, summit as well. Thank you. Tim, would you like to offer any closing comments? Well, maybe my, la my last comment would just be that we, we keep in mind this idea that we've been struck with, that, that the, the thing about tobacco is it's a, w it's a winnable battle. And, and it's something where we, we do have the capacity uh, the, with governmental activity, non-governmental activity, uh, private sector activity in, in the world to keep Africa from going down the mm -hmm. devastating path that we've gone, gone through. We have middle income countries that have the, the internal capacity to, as many of them are, grasp hold of their destiny, and some of them aren't, of grasping hold of their destiny and, and stopping this epidemic in its tracks and then reversing it. And, and we, certainly within the United States, it, it, we have the capacity to turn tobacco use into a minor public health nuisance with all the tools that we have at hand and a little creative ingenuity over the next five to ten years and focus. We can turn it into a minor public health nuisance. There's no reason why we have to be struggling like this 50 years from now or have a billion deaths to have our great-grandchildren great look back on the 21st century and say, what were we thinking that we let a billion people die for this you know, ridiculous uh, reason. Makes no sense. Thank you. Thank you. Tom, congratulations on a, a really fine paper. We're very okay. proud and, uh, to be associated with it. You get the last word this afternoon. Well, thank you for that. And uh, thank you again for the opportunity to do the paper and uh, for this event today and all of you uh, coming. Um, I do think there is uh, leadership to be tapped out there. I'm reminded, I was thinking that um, uh, a lot of what is going to move tobacco forward is going to be holding people to commitments that they've already made. It is the convention is the most wide, one of the most widely subscribed treaties in the world. I was thinking of yet a, another USGR alumnus, but uh, I'm not sure if it's World Bank president or ambassador Zelik now, but is actually on record supporting with uh, former Prime Minister Gordon Brown this type of taxation on tobacco to fund this purpose. There are institutions and leaders out there, and I think it's uh, incumbent on all of us to, uh, to make the case for them to uh, give them the room to operate on this important issue. Thank you, Tom. And I just want to repeat my, on behalf of everyone here, our thanks to all of you for being with us this afternoon and for Tim and, and Kirsten for coming from Atlanta to be with us. So please okay. join me. Well, my, my ex-wife's going to Either of you. <laughs> <laughs>